started and yep. Open it to uh, let me let me know when we're live and I'll just go straight to Chloe for uh, details on how to participate and then I'll call it in. Chloe, you want to read it? And I'll have it on the screen. I'm I'm ready when you are. Okay. All right. So we are we are going live. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's meeting of uh, Capitola City Council. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over uh, to staff uh, to have Chloe read some information about how to participate in tonight's meeting. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Welcome to the Capitola City Council meeting. In accordance with the current Santa Cruz County Health Order and the Governor's Executive Order N2920, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. As always, this city council meeting is cable cast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8, and will be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Our technician tonight is Kingston Rivera. Thank you, Kingston. If you are watching on community TV and would instead prefer to join the Zoom webinar, please visit the City of Capitola homepage and click on City Council Meeting under Upcoming Events as you see on the screen. As a webinar attendee, your microphone is muted for the entire meeting unless you request to be unmuted during a public comment period. You do not need a microphone, camera, screen, or computer. If you only want to listen to the meeting, the meeting is accessible by landline or mobile phone. To join this webinar using a telephone only, dial any of the following numbers now shown on the screen. The webinar ID is also provided. Remember that the mayor will announce the public comment period for each item. There are several ways to make a public comment. If you are a Zoom webinar attendee, simply click raise your hand and wait to be unmuted by our moderator. If you've called into Zoom by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand and wait to be unmuted. To email a comment, send your email to the address shown on the screen. One comment verbally or by email per person per item is allowed. If you send more than one email about the same item, the last received will be read and displayed. Comments received outside the public comment period will not be included in the record. Thank you for attending this Capitola City Council meeting. Mayor Peterson, I'll turn back to you to call the meeting to order. Thank you so much. All right, we'll go ahead and call tonight's meeting to order. Can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Present. Council Member Botworth. Here. Council Member Story. Here. Vice Mayor Brooks. I think I saw her here earlier, but I think she might be having connectivity issues. Okay. We'll just say um, remote for now. And Mayor Peterson. Here, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United of States, United States of, America. of America and to the and republic, to the republic for, which it stands, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, with liberty for, all. And justice for all. All right. Um, are there any additional materials for tonight's meeting? Yes, we have. Um, two public comment emails were sent regarding item 6C. Um, for lifeguards, the, the desire for lifeguards. 
There's also a revised staff report regarding item 7C, and there were revised supporting documents sent for item 7D. Great, thank you. Are there any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes. Great, thank you. All right, we'll now go to public, oh. No? Okay. We'll now go to uh, public comments uh, tonight. Uh, excuse me. This is the opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on an item that is not on tonight's agenda. So I'll turn it over uh, to our moderator. I'm not sure. I think that's Larry this evening. Um, is he with us? Yes, that's correct. I'm, I'm here. I, I don't have a camera tonight. But, uh, okay. If you do not see anyone with a hand raised on the, the Zoom meeting. Okay. Um, I do see one public comment for email regard from email for this um, public comment. So I will try and get this running again. So share screen. Sorry. Dear Mayor and Council, I want to share the City of Capitola's response rates to the 2020 Census. Currently, Capitola has a response rate of 64.1% and the County of Santa Cruz has a response rate of 66.5%. Census results will inform how hundreds of billions of dollars are allocated to our communities in areas such as housing, food assistance, and health care. We are urging local governments to engage and encourage their residents to self-response at 2020census.gov or call 844-468-2020. It has never been easier to respond on your own to the 2020 census, whether online, over the phone, or by mail all without having to meet a census taker. I appreciate the City of Capitola passing a resolution last year to support the 2020 census. Enumerators are scheduled to start going to households that have not responded in August. Your help in boosting self-response prior to that date would be appreciated. Thank you for your time and engagement. Kindly, Tori Del Favero. Tori Del Favero, Partnership Specialist. Is that all of our email public comment for this evening? I think that must I be I will it. take that as a yes. I'm sorry, yeah, um, that is it. There's no, no, no more emails for just public comment. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on to city council and staff comments. We'll start with staff. Does any staff have any comments for this evening? I don't think we have any updates for you tonight other than the regular agenda items later in, later on this evening. Great, thank you. Uh, and we'll go to city council for comments. I see council member Bertrand has his hand up. Yeah, earlier this week I met with uh, FDIU labor um, regarding a sanitation labor issue. Thank you for that update, council member Bertrand. Council member Botworth. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, really quick, I just want to thank the uh, citizens of Capitola that have uh, been patient with the construction that's been going on, especially on Capitola Avenue with some uh, sewer repair and on Park Avenue. I, I know the uh, impact of cars in the neighborhood uh, can be bothersome, but uh, both of those jobs are completed, and I think in a pretty fast time, so uh, those two streets are back to normal, and I appreciate the patience of uh, everybody in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Hi, thank you. I'm, um, I just wanted to report out um, that I would like to encourage uh, our citizens of Capitola to continue to wear their masks out in the public. Um, also, I'd like to touch on um, that I attended the Black Lives Matters March here in the city, and it was a beautiful thing to see. It was, um, it was 
highly uh, attended and um, there was wonderful speakers from all over the county who um, really addressed the issues that we're, we're seeing today. There are a couple of things that I'd also like to request staff to um, bring forward um, at a future agenda, um, as a future agenda item. Um, one of them would be to bring back at a future meeting um, the uh, possibility of obtaining the title for the Escalona Road extension. Also, there is um, the DOJ has released tobacco enforcement funding uh, with a deadline of August 7th. Um, I believe it was sent to a few of uh, our staff, but I would be really interested in looking at that, especially since we just passed the ordinance for the anti uh, uh, vaping. And also the League of Cities released a report and referenced the notice of funding or a, a NOFA in regards to the home key grants that our city might be um, able to apply for as well. So those are just a few few things I'd like to um, have staff to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, and then I would just like to, to make a couple quick comments. Uh, as Vice Mayor Brooks mentioned, it's incredibly critical that we continue to wear our masks and observe social distancing uh, during this time. If anyone saw the press conference with our county health officer today, uh, the Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County has been flagged uh, due to our rising case counts. Um, I believe at the about a month ago, we had something like 300 cases, and as of today, we have uh, 848, I believe it was. So because of how rapidly our case numbers are going up in the county, we have been flagged. Um, if the county stays on that flag list for three days, we then go to a monitoring list. After three days on that uh, monitoring list or watch list, um, the state will create a new health order for our county, um, and it will require, require additional closures. Um, so, so please do uh, keep in mind the importance of social distancing, of wearing masks. Um, during the press conference today, uh, the county health officer acknowledged that while people were concerned that some of the protest uh, marches or, or would um, lead to a rise in cases, that none of our uh, current cases have been traced back to those marches, uh, likely because there was such a high number of people wearing masks um, during those, those activities. So please do keep that in mind as we move forward uh, so that we can see our way out of this. Uh, additionally, as was mentioned in public comment, 2020 census is incredibly important. If I remember correctly, um, each person that uh, fills out the census could bring approximately $2,000 in federal funding to our district. And it uh, additionally um, determines the funding for our schools, for our communities, um, and, uh, and also determines our representation. Uh, and, and our lines for representation in our district. So please do fill that out. Um, it's incredibly important. Everyone counts, children count, children count. Uh, your, your immigration status is, is not um, uh, an issue. You just fill it out and, and you count. Uh, so please do that. And thank you uh, to um, uh, the resident that, that brought that important issue to light during public comment this evening. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, our item six, our consent calendar. These items will be voted on by one motion in the form listed below. Um, before I take it to public comment on our consent, I'll ask if there's any uh, council members uh, that are interested in pulling any items. Seeing none, uh, we will go to public comment on the consent calendar and then we'll return for a vote. Larry, can you let us know if there's any public comment for the consent calendar? I do not see any hands raised, and I do not see any emails for public affairs consent calendar. Great, thank you. Uh, in that case, I'll bring it back to council for uh, a motion and a vote. Motion to the consent calendar. Second. We have a motion from council member Bautorf and a second from council member Bertrand. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, council member Bertrand. Aye. Council member Bautorf. Aye. Council member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Carries unanimously. Thank you. 
We'll move on to item seven, general government public hearings for tonight. 7A, uh, 207 Oakland Avenue appeal. I'll bring it over to staff for a staff report. All right. Can everybody see me? You're good. Let me get the uh, presentation up. The item before you, uh, or, good, or good evening, uh, council members, and uh, sorry, uh, it's my first presentation here, but uh, the item before you is an appeal of a planning commission denial of a design permit, secondary dwelling unit, and fence exception to remodel three existing residential structures, including an addition of 131 square feet to one structure located at 207 Oakland Avenue in the R1 zoning district. The proposal reduces the number of dwelling units to comply with current zoning standards from one duplex and two single family residences to one single family residence, one secondary dwelling unit, and one detached living space. Following the planning commission denial, the applicant updated their plans to remove the fence exception and add landscaping along the frontage. The application went before the planning commission on June 4th, 2020 and was denied as both motions for approval resulted in a tie and therefore failed. The city received an appeal to city council at, on June 11th, 2020. The existing site layout at 207 Oakland includes one duplex and two single family residences as seen here. The existing multifamily use located within the R1 zoning district is considered a non-conforming use. The non-conforming use must be discontinued 50 years from the date of the activity became non-conforming, which is on September 27, 2029, unless granted an extension by city council. The owner opted to correct the non-conforming use rather than ask for an extension. The proposed site layout, as seen here, the applicant is proposing to convert existing structures to one single family residence, one secondary dwelling unit and one detached living space to bring the property into compliance. In these next slides, I'm gonna provide a brief overview of the applicant's proposal. Uh, seen here in yellow are the uh, four existing parking spaces uh, along Oakland Avenue. No additional parking is required due to the limited size of the addition. This is the design of the proposed single family residence. The Spanish style design features clay tile roof, stucco siding, and a mix of rectangular and arched windows. A rear second story deck will be converted into enclosed space, but the front second story deck facing Oakland Avenue is to remain. These architectural details are carried out through all three structures. This is the design of the proposed detached living space. And this is the design of the proposed secondary dwelling unit. As you can see, the Spanish design elements are carried through each of the three structures. During the planning commission hearing, commissioners raised several concerns. Among them, one, the applicability of the Mellow Act to the intent of capital's affordable uh, housing ordinance and three, the design considerations with respect to the neighborhood. The Mellow Act seeks to preserve affordable housing in coastal zones by prohibiting local governments from authorizing conversion or demolition of existing units, um, uh, existing affordable housing units, excuse me. However, the Mellow Act specifies that no replacement units are required when the project involves 10 or fewer units in more than one structure. The subject property contains four units in three structures. Therefore, the Mellow Act's limitations on the removal of units and replacement requirements are not applicable. 
The capital inclusionary housing ordinance was also referenced as further justification, justification against approving the project. Commissioner Newman referenced the findings of the housing ordinance to illustrate how decreasing density on this site is counter to the stated goals of the city's inclusionary housing ordinance. Further concerns were raised with respect to the Mediterranean style, the wall, and the entry gate. Within the new zoning code, or within the zoning code, there are specific considerations when reviewing a design permit. In regards to architectural character, the council must consider the suitability of the building for its purpose and the appropriate use of materials to ensure compatibility. Commissioner Ruth raised concerns with compatibility of the design within the neighborhood. In reviewing the appeal, the council should also consider the city's general plan and local coastal plan. The general plan land use element describes the Depot Hill neighborhood as detached single family homes on, rel on relatively small lots uh, that create an intimate feel. A high concentration of historic single family homes, a variety of architectural styles, and a sidewalk exemption allowance contributes to the neighborhood's coastal village feel. The land use plan within Capitola's local coastal plan creates the policy for new development on Depot Hill to maintain the special character and to be designed for compatibility with the scale and architecture of the area. Finally, following Planning Commission denial, the applicant submitted revised plans to reduce the wall height to six feet to comply with fence standards. The revisions also include a landscape strip around the parking area and new plantings, new plantings throughout. Uh, the green areas shown are the areas that have been revised for landscaping, and they are visible in front of the wall. With reduced fence height, the application complies with all development standards of the R1 zoning district. With that, staff recommends City Council uphold the appeal and approve the project based on conditions of approval and findings. Great, thank you so much. Are there any questions from council members? Sorry, hold on, I didn't have the participants bar up to see if there's any hands raised. Okay, forgive me because I didn't see whose hand went up first, so I'm just going to start at the top and go down. So we'll start with Council Member Story. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks, Sean. That was uh, very well done for your first time. Um, I wanted to um, ask about the front wall, if you could go back to that slide. Um, and particularly, I wanted to ask about the in way um, and I don't know how that's categorized is that part of the wall or is that a separate structure um, and how is that height permitted in relationship to the wall yes yeah, so that was actually reviewed separate from the fence standards it is considered an accessory structure and uh, as you noted, it is well above the, the wall height. Um, however, one thing to take note, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to the site plan, uh, is the fact that this structure, this accessory structure is behind the front setback. So it, as long as it actually um, doesn't go over the 15 foot height limitation, it, it, it's uh, within the R1 zoning district standards. It, it does, it was calculated as a part of the floor area as well. So this was given a review that would have been similar to a minor design review. And thank you. All right, we'll go to council member Bossler. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just have, uh, I, I had a question about uh, for the city attorney, but I think uh, Sean covered that in the presentation with regard to the Mellow Act. So. I just have one question. Uh, Sean, 
I know there's lots of codes uh, and ordinances that I'm not so familiar with, but uh, I look, but could you tell me what code uh, exists that uh, does not allow for gentrification in Capitola? Could you say that last uh, part again? I want to know that what code uh, there is that says that gentrification is not allowed in Capitola. Uh, there's no code section like that that I'm aware of. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, um, so in the living, Sean, uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. It was very good. I um, appreciate that. In the living quarters, I know in the discussion there's only a bathroom going to be in there. Can this be converted to a full living quarter in the future? Are you referring to the uh, detached living space? Living space? Yes, uh, living space, excuse me. Um, I mean, would we be able to do that? Because we can only have one ADU uh, that's detached as far as I know. I don't under- believe you could uh, get a permit to convert that into a an additional accessory dwelling unit. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Any additional questions from council? Seeing none. Uh, okay. Seeing none. Uh, we will bring this to public comment. Public comment for this item is now open, and I will turn it over to our moderator uh, to call on attendees and those who have sent in emails. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, we have Derek von Alstein. He is uh, the person with a hand up in the Zoom meeting, so I will allow to talk at this point. Good evening, Council. Uh, this is Derek von Alstein. I am the designer of this project and uh, many others. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to thank staff uh, for their hard work uh, on uh, helping us get this project to comply. Um, this is a very uh, interesting uh, project in that it's uh, the buildings as they are very run down. It's it's they're they're hard to deal with. Um, I think uh, we've come up with a, a plan that'll work and that'll fit in nicely with the neighborhood. Um, the uh, w- the one thing that I would impress upon the uh, upon the council is that when it went to uh, planning commission, we only had four commissioners, so we didn't want to have a case where it came where it went around and around. We didn't want to have it come to council and then go back to planning because. Uh, the, it would be in the same condition because we had one commissioner that, that had to uh, recuse himself. So um, that being said, um, I, I think that we've uh, shown in the revisions that we've provided that uh, we put extra uh, care into doing the landscape to soften the the, uh, the hardscape in front of the wall and to soften the wall itself and the reduction of the wall all serve to um, help the project um, fit in and cushion uh, the surfaces. Uh, so the, and the other, the other piece to this is that, you know, with having everything back that far from the street, and it, it, it in fact uh, does a nice job just, just in the setback of, of, of softening the impact. Um, if, if, there, if this were a single family parcel, uh, you'd probably be building um, quite a few more square feet because it would be allowed. Um, so it's not an intense use of the site, and I, and I think it's a good redevelopment of the site. And in, in terms of the uh, architectural style, um, you know, you have the Venetian, you have the uh, uh, you have the uh, Casablanca on the corner. You have other, uh, uh, there are a plethora of, of uh, Mediterranean buildings. Uh, the Risbon Mansion, one of them. Um, the Venetian, of course. 
Um, and that's all part of Capitola's history, and there's lots of room in Capitola for different styles. There are different styles all throughout Capitola. Um, that means my time's up, and I, uh, if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. Doesn't look, Larry, doesn't look like we have any additional attendees with their hands raised. I, I do not see any. We do have a few emails. Uh, okay. And I will start and I will try and share as quick as I can. Um, I'm Jan Gallatly. My husband and I just purchased our home at 502 Escalona Drive in Depot Hill. I heard of the proposed changes to the multi-unit dwelling on Oakland Ave. I strongly oppose to the tall fence out in front of the property with parking spaces in front of it. This will look like an apartment building. The style of the proposed fence doesn't look or feel at all beachy. I don't feel the style fits in with the neighborhood at all. I don't think enclosing properties is the direction that homes should take. I am opposed to the fence being built in the manner proposed. Jan Galletly. Jan Galletly Interiors. Diablo Design Group. One. Okay, I'm going for the next one. Sorry. It's given me a message I've never seen before. I apologize. Dear sir or madam, I live at 211 Oakland Avenue next door to the subject property. We have been at 211 Oakland for seven years and not only love Depot Hill, we've successfully encouraged three couples slash best friends to buy homes here. The neighborhood is unique in many wonderful ways. We knew when we purchased our home that 207 had, and would likely always have, a two-story structure and another single-story one on our joint lot line. Don't have to like it, but can't complain about it. However, the structures next door are at least reasonably consistent with the overall neighborhood and the parking in front of the structures but on the lot services the lot well. The proposed remodel slash renovation poses three key negatives I hope the council will consider and reject. One, converting a four structure compound that more or less blends into the neighborhood into a Mediterranean set of structures will make it stand out starkly both visually in and of itself and versus the overall optics of the neighborhood. Two, a large wall across the front would worsen that considerably and be highly unusual. And three, the wall will likely push the three to five cars off in there into the street. I understand the desire of the new owners to make this property their own, but this plan negatively impacts the neighborhood unnecessarily. Thank you for your consideration. Rex Jackson, 211 Oakland Avenue. My name is Elizabeth Jackson. I live at 211 Oakland Avenue. At the June 4th meeting, I made a comment about the Mediterranean style of the proposed house and that it does not fit the style in Depot Hill. One of the council members contradicted that saying there are many Mediterranean style houses. Since then, I have walked all the walkable streets in Depot Hill and found the mass majority to be wood style siding or shingle. I found 26 that are stucco and wood, including 207 Oakland Avenue. I found only one, 304 Grand Avenue, that is a similar Mediterranean style is proposed and it does not fit in with its neighbor's wood style. So once again I want to comment that this style of house is not appropriate for Depot Hill. In my walk around I also saw no tall solid walls in front of houses in Depot Hill. There are a few hedges that have grown tall but none are in combination with tall solid walls. Most houses have either no fence at all in front or they have a low fence around three feet tall and many are picket fences. 
I object to the wall being solid and tall because what will be seen from the street will look like an apartment building with parking in front up to the wall. The residents have four cars and no covered parking so all will be parked in front of the property or on the street. The architect is clearly getting around the Capitola 3 feet 6 inches front fence rule by having the wall be slightly further back from the street than the front of the house. This is a fine point that may let them build a 6 foot wall but the spirit of the rule is clearly meant to have front fences and walls limited to 3 feet 6 inches, therefore I strongly object to allowing 2 extra feet of wall to be solid as requested. Perhaps as a compromise they can step the wall down from 6 to 3 or 4 feet at the gate and then have the gate be 3 feet 6 inches tall. That would give it a more welcoming appearance. Thank you, Elizabeth Jackson. Okay, I have one more for this item. To whom it may concern. I am responding to the appeal notice received regarding the denied design permit request at 207 Oakland Avenue discussed at the last public hearing. As mentioned in my previous email, I do not believe a Mediterranean design and solid aid perimeter wall is conducive to the eclectic beach community of Depot Hill. Although the appeal mentions that Depot Hill has several similar style homes, I personally am not familiar with many. Additionally, it is was my understanding that the front fence permit standards state a maximum height of 3 feet 6 inches. I am sure that the proposed home will be beautifully designed however with the tall 8 solid barrier and parking lot facing the front, it will not be at all attractive or community minded which is why it is important to maintain our front fence standards. I hope that you will consider my comments and deny the design permit as currently proposed. Sincerely, Andrea Dorman. Okay, so that appears to be all the public comments we have for that item. Uh, wait, hold on, let me check real quick. I may be wrong. Oh, wait, no, we did get one more in. My, my, my apologies. I have looked at application for fences, and it requires only three six for front yards. This exception for this property is way over that. Ann Greeninger, 212 Oakland Avenue, Capitola 9. Okay, that looks like all the public comments for this item. Great, thank you. With that, we'll bring this item back to council for deliberation and a vote. Uh, if there's any council members that would like to comment, uh, feel free to use the raise hand button and we'll get going on a discussion. Council member Bottor, we'll start with you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have to say um, I'm very troubled by this appeal for many reasons. Uh, and I, the first thing I want to do is I want to apologize to the owners that submitted this because I'm sorry they had to go through this project. Um, I got on the council eight years ago, and one of the main reasons I ran is that uh, there was a project being built on Depot Hill. Uh, uh, it's the church on the corner of Escalona and I'm going to say Oakland. I mean, I had that right. But it's the church building that, that I believe turned out to be one of the most beautiful remodels or reconstructions done in town. Uh, there were people on the planning commission then that instead of uh, looking at the codes and ordinances that were available, took more of their personal opinions uh, to stop that project. Uh, what ended up happening there was there, there's a wall that happens to be built all the way across that property. Uh, and I think I still say it's one of the most beautiful buildings uh, in the city. Um, and that motivated me to, to have one of my standards is I'm here to protect, <clears throat> excuse me, protect the rights of homeowners and what they do with their property. If we let public opinion sway what people did with their property, people would find all kinds of things wrong. Um, another note that was made was uh, Commissioner Ruth noted that the site improvements uh, did, did not support the Mediterranean design because it doesn't fit in the neighborhood and it doesn't exist throughout the city. So 
I, uh, I went out and presented a little uh, PowerPoint, and if uh, I can get the assistance from staff, I'd like to run that now and uh, show a little survey of Mediterranean homes in Capitola. Is that possible? This is Sean. I, I'm about to put that up for you. Thank you, Sean. One first picture is the one located in Depot Hill. Oops. Yeah, the, the first picture, upper left corner, is in Depot Hill. The second home next to it, again in Depot Hill. The third picture and fourth is of another house, again in Depot Hill. Uh, you get over to the uh, pictures on the right, that's uh, Sanmar, Sanmar, and Sanmar. And then I think there's one other slide, maybe two, Sean. Yeah, that's all Sanmar, Sanmar, Sanmar there. And then here we have uh, these other four on the left are all in the jewel box. The other two are uh, two more in the jewel box and one in Riverview. Uh, next slide. And I guess you could say that there's no Mediterranean uh, in Capitola, oops. Maybe the Venetians, maybe the most famous buildings in this town. So for someone to say that Mediterranean doesn't exist is ludicrous. Uh, the other picture on the left I want you to pay attention to on the right, I'm sorry. There's a lot of people that are eclectic with their homes. I just put this on there because it happens to be a home, the jewel box, that somebody attached butterflies to the wall because that was their way of expressing themselves. And I don't, I think that when neighbors come out and are punitive against other neighbors because they dislike something, I think what the planning commission needs to adhere to is the sets of codes and ordinances and apply them and keep their personal bias out of this. As was mentioned by, uh, by the architect, I believe one of the reasons that, that the problems with this project failing was one of our uh, planning commissioners had to recuse himself. I, I think our councils and our commissions are strongest when we have a full vote. Uh, I feel pretty sure that if there would have been a full vote, we wouldn't be having this hearing today. And I think there's one more picture, Sean, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is the last slide. Okay. There, there was another picture in there. It didn't make it, but I'll just go ahead and tell you about the house. There was a house up in the jewel box. The entire front yard is landscaped with cactus. I think we're all familiar with it. It's just, you know, you may not like what your neighbor does, but there are certain rights that you're entitled to as a homeowner, and and that's my main reason. So uh, I will be uh, supporting this. In fact, I'd like to make a motion that we support the appeal of the owners. I'd like also like to uh, include in that that they not be charged the fee, as I believe that uh, this was done inappropriately by the Planning Commission. Thank you. I'll second that. Thank you, Council Member Bautor. If we have a motion and a second, we'll continue conversation with Council Member Story. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, you know, before I began, I, I want to disclose that, uh, you know, I had walked over to the property um, just yesterday and I had an opportunity to speak with the uh, appellants about that project. So I just want to disclose that I have been on site um, and um, I'd like to, um, one, address um, the, well, now I think three issues that have come up uh, concerning the project. Um, one is concerning the reduction in affordable housing. Um, as Sean already mentioned, you know, the Mellow Act doesn't apply. I don't think our inclusionary ordinance would apply in this situation. Um, however, as I understand from the staff report, what has caused the reduction um, in the amount of housing, um, even if there is, they, you know, the number of units that have been reduced is very minor, but even to that extent, it's due to our own zoning ordinance, which prohibited the applicants from putting in a multifamily, in other words, replacing what was there. Um, so um, I don't think the applicant should be penalized for uh, our own ordinance, um, and I think I have a greater concern 
about the um, expiration of the non-conforming uses um, you know, in, on Depot Hill, because there are several uh, multifamily uh, apartments, uh, uh, dwellings here that will expire in 2029. And I think on a, just on a housing public policy basis, the council needs to contend with that issue uh, or we're going to end up losing uh, many other uh, affordable housing um, on Depot Hill. Uh, concerning um, the style, um, well, I, I don't think I could uh, um, better what uh, Councilman Bortoff showed us. And I just want to confirm that on Depot Hill, there are, there are many um, homes that are in the Mediterranean stucco Spanish style. Um, it's not a majority of them, but there are sufficient numbers that here. Our general plan recognizes that Depot Hill has a variety of architectural styles. Um, uh, and our local coastal plan uh, requires that um, new developments be compatible uh, with the architecture of the area. And I certainly could not could not find that this particular style is not in keeping with the architecture <clears throat> of the area. It matches several other homes. And then I also wanted to comment about, because uh, many of the neighbors raised concerns about the wall um, up in front. Um, and I'll say probably personally, you know, that's not um, a favorite aspect of the project from my personal point of view but I'm not here to project onto um, the property owners, my personal point of view. Um, what my requirement is to look at what our zoning codes allow and what they don't allow. Um, and it so happens that the zoning code, because the wall is behind the setback line, um, it is allowed to be up to six feet. Um, and I had asked the question about the entrance and that is considered a separate accessory um, structure um, and which is a, allowed uh, to be at that height. Um, so, you know, because of that, even though I personally don't, I don't care for it, um, for all the reasons that some of the neighbors mentioned, um, that certainly can't be a basis for me to vote to deny this appeal. Um, so I'm going to support the motion, and I do support uh, waiving the appeal fee um, on the, <clears throat> the applicants. Um, and so that will uh, conclude my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Story. Councilmember Bertrand. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, I too went out there, and um, I've known of that house because, um, well, I've probably knocked on most homes in this town a couple of times, like. So many of us who've run for city council, and I've known of that house. And I think the upgrades that they're gonna be making is gonna be a great improvement to the neighborhood there. I think it'll look um, so much better. So from that standpoint, I think in general, neighbors will like it when it gets completed. Um, I talked to two neighbors. I didn't get any sense that there was a controversy. Um, I was informed about other problems in the neighborhood though. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept trying to steer back to the project at hand, and um, they were fine, or they didn't think of anything that they had to complain about. But I didn't do a complete survey. I just talked to people that are on that block. Um, so from the standpoint of empathy, I could see this gate and the, and the entrance way for some people to be an issue, although I've seen many similar things around Capitola. But this is a family that's moving in. I believe their two sons are gonna be there. And I think it's like a family compound. I, I know many houses in Capitola that are like that. Where, um, you know, and that's very Spanish. I've traveled in Mexico, lived there multiple times, various short periods of time. And there's many compounds like that where it's, it's a family, family affair, basically. You go in the main gate, and um, I think there's many examples of that around the world. 
Um, so it's not unusual. It may be a little bit different than what is generally here in Capitola. But I think that's why they're doing this. So I, I think that it's going to be a very nice home when it's completed, and the family is going to greatly enjoy it. And I hope the neighbors eventually welcome them as members of the neighborhood. Thank you. I will be supporting them, obviously. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, do you have any comments? No? Okay. Um, I have a, a question. So, uh, and full disclosure, I'm well aware of the property because I lived on it uh, two or two and a half or three years ago. I was at 207 uh, Oakland, uh, number two, the back half of, of what is now the duplex. Um, and my understanding was when uh, those of us that lived there, uh, we had to leave because they were remodeling and then a new group of people of renters came in. So am I to understand now that the people, the four uh, units that are there now have renters in them and they will now be displaced? Is that my understanding? Does anyone know? I, I can speak to that. Um, the, during the public hearing at Planning Commission, the owner that we spoke and there, at that time, there was only one unit that was um, being rented. At the time, the other three were empty. And the one tenant that was renting had plans to move out this summer. OK, thank you. And, and so um, this will essentially no longer be uh, uh, multifamily housing. This will be a single family dwelling and the entire property and all of the uh, dwelling units on it will be under one one family, correct? No. no. That's not correct? No. That is correct. It'll be a single family home with one family. Um, they'll have a secondary dwelling unit that they're allowed to rent out to a, to a separate entity, but um, it will no longer be a multi-family fortnight. So whether or not they rent out the, the secondary dwelling unit is up to them. Okay, so we so in, in one essentially no matter how you how you uh, word it, we are we are losing uh, units for renters, correct? Two units, two units renters. Okay. All right. Um, well, I, I I have to say I'm I'm concerned that we're losing uh, additional housing, uh, additional housing units. Um, when I lived there, we joked and, and called it, the, my neighbors and I called it the compound, but the wall in front of it uh, really does make it look like a compound. And to be quite honest, it reminds me of, um, I want to say it's on Portola, there's, there's a house that you drive by and all you see from the street is a wall and you can't even tell really that there's a house behind it. So it's concerning. I, I'm not a fan of the style. I'm concerned that we're losing housing that would otherwise be available. Um, but I, I understand that, um, you know, we're not making decisions based on our own opinions, so I'm disappointed, but I will support the motion. There's no additional comments. We have a motion in second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botorf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Councilmember Bro uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Moving on, we have uh, item 6B, and up to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's 6, 7B. Uh, an update to the Community Development Block Grant Coronavirus Response Application. Hey, Mayor, before you begin this item, um, yes. I'd like to disclose that uh, um, my wife's agency, Community Action Board, is one of the proposed applicants. So. Based on that, um, I have a conflict and I'm, I'm going to recuse myself. Thank you, Council Member Story. Council Member Story, all you need to do is um, mute us and so that you can't hear the discussion. If maybe you've already done that, you can't hear me. And then we'll just wave when we're um, ready to bring you back. Okay, I, Sam, I don't mean to belay this, but are you saying that I didn't need to disclose? No, I'm saying that if you're going to recuse yourself from this item in these days oh. of Zoom, you don't have to physically leave the room. You just have to mute us and how to, how to do it. I, I get it. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Good evening, Mayor Peterson and City Council. Um, for you tonight, I'm going to discuss the CDBG CD grant. On March 27th, 2020, Congress passed the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act to support preparation for and response to the community impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the state of California received approximately 19 million in CARES Act funding. Capitola is a non-entitlement community due to our population being less than 50,000 people. This is important to understand as entitlement communities are subject to oversight by HUD under the federal government. Um, as a non-entitlement community, we're subject to the state um, standards um, and just the, the disbursement of funds for non-entitlement communities will be through the California Department of Housing and Community Development through CDBG, Community Development Block Grant Program. HCD has different guidance tied to the funding than the federal government. So many of the projects that you're hearing about our neighbors doing with this funding, um, when they have populations over 50,000, they have different regulations that they can work under. Um, there will be three rounds of CDBG CV grants. Um, the grant announcement identified up to $88,000 of available CDBG CV grants for the City of Capitola in the first round of funding. The City also has approximately $80,000 in CDBG program income funds. This money came from one down payment assistant loan that was, paid, that was recently paid off by the program participant. The CDBG uh, program income funds may be utilized in response to COVID-19 pandemic on eligible grant activities. So that gives us more money to utilize on the first round. In total, we have approximately $168,000 of funds. The funds may be utilized for up to three CDBG activities. And also because we have the program income funds as well, we can do an additional program. Um, activities must be related to the preparation, prevention, response, and recovery of the COVID-19 pandemic in the immediate and medium term response. Each round of funding is limited to the three CDBG activities. Um, so in this slide, I have listed what qualifies as a CDBG activity. Um, as you know, we put together an ad hoc committee made up of our mayor and vice mayor. Um, they've met three times since the, res since the original resolution was adopted by the City Council. And during these meetings, have tried to prioritize activities for the first round of funding. Um, during the second ad hoc meeting, the committee identified public services, including food and rental assistance, as well as economic development, business assistance, as a priority for the first round of funding. Details on the economic development program were published after the second ad hoc meeting. And unfortunately, the economic development program put in place um, by the state HCD is more restrictive than the program under the federal HUD. Um, under the federal HUD program, um, allow, it, it allowed entitlement communities to provide funds to small businesses through grants. HCD is not allowing economic development grants. All economic development activities providing financial assistance to businesses require loans with underwriting. Uh, so Watsonville had a program of giving $2,000 per business to help with uh, rental or utility coverage. To do underwriting for that would be a significant effort for um, a small amount of money. Uh, so within the standards that we'll be working under, each loan must um, aid a business for a minimum of three months and provide proof of retention of low and moderate income jobs. The underwriting requirements include documentation of 2019 profit and loss statements and must show impact of COVID-19 and necessary funding to ensure the job retention. Currently, there is not a local economic development nonprofit with a program in place to administer such loans with the underwriting requirements. Staff is working with a local economic development nonprofit to establish a loan program with an underwriting partner, but the program is not yet established and the goal of when you receive your funds is to get them out as soon as possible. 
Um, so during the third ad hoc committee meeting, the group was told of this new challenge presented for the economic development funding. With the new information, the ad hoc committee recommended funding public service activities, including food and rental assistance for the first round, and then to focus on economic development, homeless services, and assistance for after-school programs during the second round. Staff contact is local nonprofits that provide food distribution services and rental assistance to Capitola residents, requesting information on the need relative to COVID-19 pandemic. This slide shows the requested funds in the third column and the ad hoc committee recommendation on the last column. The one item that will not be fully funded is lift line, or the two items, and community action board. It is important to note the city provided community action board with $25,000 in funds from the housing successor agency fund for fiscal year 2021, as we have historically done for towards rental assistance. So under for community action board, the total funds that they will receive with this $20,000 grant and the $25,000 um, from our housing successor fund is a total of $45,000. So it's close to the 50,000 that they were requesting. And the, the good news is when these, uh, when the needs came in, um, if you were to take the uh, lift line out of the equation, we were within $1,000 of meeting um, the needs of all the, for food um, requests for, for our Capitola residents in these three, um, nonprofits that have uh, supported our residents for a long time. So great to have this available funding come so close to the need. Um, so this evening, staff is recommending that the council adopt the proposed resolution amending resolution 4175 to revise the funding allocations between eligible activities and authorize the city manager to enter into sub-recipient agreements with community bridges, graveyards, Second Harvest Food Bank, and the Community Action Board. Thank you. That concludes my presentation, and I'm available for questions. All right. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, Katie, can you just tell us when the next round or when we anticipate the next round of funding will come in and approximately how much we're anticipating? So the next round, um, I actually spoke with Paul Ashby, our new consultant that's helping with CDBG grants, and he said there was no update on the um, exact timing of the next round, but they, the HCD mentioned they hope to have the next uh, notice of um, funding availability out in about approximately 60 days. He said that uh, through his... Um, work over the years with HCD, it, it's typically a little bit longer. So let's say 60 plus days. And then the question about how much funding. In the second round, we're expecting to get more funding, but because we had our program income funds to tie into this, it won't be great. It, it most likely, I'm not sure, you know, uh, we won't know until the notice of uh, the NOFA comes out. It'll tell us exactly, but it should be larger than the 88,000 that we saw in this first round. Thank you. You're welcome. Any additional questions at this time from council members? Seeing none, we'll uh, open public comment for this item. I'll turn it over to Larry to moderate our public comment. Um, I do not, let's see. I do not see hands raised, Mayor Peterson, and let me see if I have any emails. I do not see any emails either about this item. Okay, great. With that, we will close public comment and bring it back to council for discussion and a vote. Um, Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment. Um, Katie, you had mentioned um, that we were looking at the possibility of uh, putting some of the future dollars towards after school programming. And I just wanted to offer some clarification that um, that it wouldn't just be, that our thoughts were not just for the after school program, but I just want to elaborate that it would be on early childhood and youth programming um, as, as a whole versus just specifically after school programming. So I just want to offer some of that clarity. Thank you. Yeah. 
Any additional comments? Seeing none, we will entertain a motion. Oh, hold on. Oh, Councilmember Botsworth, comments, motion? Uh, motion to approve staff recommendation. Great. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion by Councilmember Botsworth and a second by Councilmember Bertrand. Can I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Councilmember Bertrand. Yes. Councilmember Botsworth. Aye. Councilmember Story is recused. Vice Mayor Brooks. Yes, I just want to say thank you, Mayor Peterson, for working on, with me on this. Um, aye. Great. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Great. Motion carries unanimously amongst the council members voting with one recusal for council member story. So if we can bring him back. There he is. Welcome to council member story. Uh, we will go now to item. 7C, consider a proposal for an out of school time recreation program for the blended learning 2021 school year. Uh, good evening, Mayor Peterson, council members. Let me take a minute to share my screen. Council member Botler, can you put your hand down so that when we go back to comments, I'll We'll have a clean slate unless you're just dying to talk on this item already. No, I do not. I'm sorry about that, Mayor. No problem. All right. Um, so the item before you this evening is the out of school time recreation program. Um, to begin with some background. So for the past school year, uh, Recreation and the Soquel Union Elementary School District began a partnership la um, to offer an after school rec club that was hosted at New Brighton Middle School. Um, this program was very successful and we had the intent of continuing this program. However, um, the COVID-19 pandemic changed things and it then created a high need for child care program um, for school age children uh, with the school closures and then looking forward to um, medium risk models. So currently recreation is operating two successful youth programs, summer programs, um, under the current child care guidance that is um, required for these programs to operate. And staff has been working with Soquel Union Elementary School District to identify what the child care needs would be for the coming school year. Um, and in, in conjunction with those conversations, uh, staff developed an out of school time program model for elementary and middle school age youth. Um, this would include new job descriptions and pay schedule. Um, since, <laughs> with a, an update, since the um, staff report was um, written the week prior, um, this week on Monday, uh, Santa Cruz County Office of Education announced that Santa Cruz County meeting criteria to move on to the monitoring list um, schools will start the year with distance learning. Um, so originally the staff report presented a blended learning model. Um, and so what um, we are now looking at is that schools may reopen for in-person or blended learning instruction once Santa Cruz County members, uh, I'm sorry, numbers, meet criteria for 14 consecutive days. Um, and the construction of the um, staff report, the staff anticipated that there might be an additional school closure sometime during the operation of the out of school time program um, or OST program. Um, and at the moment, staff believes that child care programs will be able to operate Things change pretty regularly these days, so we will see. 
But um, this presentation is going to focus on details of how the OST programs will operate in the with the current expectation that we're going back with distance learning and that they will be operating on a full time schedule at the beginning of the school year. Um, and when or if SoCal Union um, begins a blended learning uh, model, then the OST programs will operate as detailed in the original staff board, the staff report. Uh, so, for current guidance for recreational programming slash childcare, um, participants that are enrolled in program need to be placed in stable groups of no more than 12 children. Um, those stable groups should not, cannot mix with any other group, um, and staff assigned to each group shall not mix with any other group. So all youth enrolled in a program and all staff need to remain stable. Um, in the event that a group goes into an indoor space, there can only be one group in that indoor space. And if that room is scheduled for a second group to enter, complete sanitation needs to occur between the two groups. Um, and then face covering, social distancing, health screening, and hand hygiene protocols apply for these programs. So with that, um, the first OSP program that I'm going to explain to you is the elementary, for elementary age youth. Um, and one of the significant factors um, with childcare at the moment is being able to identify a number of rooms in order to increase capacity. If you have one room, then you are only able to have a capacity of 12 in your program. And so an aspect of this program is then to identify additional rooms, additional spaces that we would be able to expand to in order to increase the capacity. Um, so for the elementary program, uh, staff reached out and developed partnerships with Shoreline Community Church, um, as well as United Way First Five, that enables us to provide a larger capacity for elementary students. Uh, the current plan would have four groups of 12, one at Jade Street Community Center, one at United Way First Five, and two groups at Shore Life Community Church for a total of 48 uh, SoCal elementary students. Um, this might be able to be, the capacity might be able to be increased um, and potentially um, provide to Main Street Elementary as well if additional sites are identified. Um, each team or each pod will have a stable staff of, that will consist of a senior leader and a leader. Ooh, excuse me. Um, we will be providing care from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. And the program will cover morning distance learning. Um, so all sites have internet access so that the students enrolled will be able to participate in their online distance learning. And then um, the program will also provide homework support, recreation activities, and healthy snacks to those enrolled. Um, in the event that there is a shift to the blended learning model that was originally outlined in the staff report um, for the AM, PM, four-day stagger, um, that that uh, SoCal Union was planning to offer, um, we would also shift this, be able to shift this program to match um, the blended learning that was originally detailed in the uh, staff report. For the middle school OSQ program, um, we would be able to provide for two groups at the Jade Street Community Center for a total of 24 participants. So um, we might be able to increase the capacity of this if additional sites were identified. Um, each shift would have stable staff 
um, that would consist of a senior leader and a leader. And also we would be providing care from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday for this program. And again, the we would have the morning um, distance learning and then switch to homework support, recreation activities, and a healthy snack. Um, in the event that we shift to a blended learning model, the middle school was planned to have the AB uh, cohort two-day rotation, and this program would be able to switch along with it. Um, also in the original staff report, there was also a proposed more classic in-person after-school type program, um, but this model will not be available um, until we shifted to a blended learning um, platform. So in the distance learning, the an in-person after-school program um, just doesn't really work with the resources that we have available. Um, additionally, for OST programs, depending on enrollment or available sites, the middle school OST may experience changes. So, for example, um, it is possible that we might see a higher demand in elementary or a lower demand for middle school. We could potentially allocate um, one of the rooms that the middle school program is currently planned for to be for elementary if um, that was something that we saw in the request for demand. Um, recreation will offer a priority enrollment phase for essential workers as well as um, so-called union teachers. Um, the distance learning model will not require transportation for elementary students as was originally detailed in the staff report. Um, so with this current distance learning model, staff will seek um, a contract with Enterprise when SoCal Union transitions to a blended learning model, hopefully at some point during the school year. Um, and because the requirements for the stable groups, drop-in care is uh, unfortunately not an option um, in any of these programs. So the consequences of providing these programs is that using the community center for them will prohibit adult classes to operate on the weekdays. Um, in preparation for this, we surveyed uh, class participants as well as instructors and received um, significant information that, they, that, that online is their preference at the time, that there is not a high interest in returning to in-person classes, whether they be indoors or outdoors, um, until the situation is safe for it. Um, for this budget, adult classes also included a revenue of uh, $250,000. Um, if we, because of that, this budget figure will need to be revised downwards and I believe will be done at a, at a meeting, a later meeting. Um, Staff will evaluate conditions for adult classes should school return to a complete in-person learning model. Hopefully um, the situation, that if, we're, if we're returning to complete in-person learning, it will also be the case that adult classes will be able to return to the community center safely. And um, the operation of the OST programs will prevent the community center from being used as a polling site in the upcoming presidential election. The, um, the upcoming election, the criteria for polling sites is different than it has been in past years, and it's actually planned to take place over four days. Um, and the, some of those days are weekdays, which would overlap with this program. Um, so, in regards to scholarship, recognizing that uh, there will be a need for scholarship, at the um, end of the school year, there were two sessions of the after school rec club that were not able to operate due to 
um, the onset of the pandemic, and that fund has a remaining $3,944 in it. Um, around in May, council allocated um, the uh, remaining of the early childhood and youth TOT to summer youth program scholarships, and currently that fund has a remaining $4,000. $550. And um, also, uh, it, we had council previously discussed the anticipated um, 2021 early childhood and youth TOT fund, um, which may be around $15,000, um, that was allocated to recreation. We had discussed several different um, types of um, categories that that could, that money could be directed to, and it could be directed to, um, to completely directed to scholarship. And if that was the choice, then the total potential funding for scholarship currently would be the $23,494 um, potential. So the intent for the OST program has been to provide a net neutral budget. Um, the OSC Elementary full-time program um, it has a projected fee revenue of $2,997,000 um, with expenses at $293,826 with a direct wage cost of Two hundred and fifty-two thousand eight forty-four. Um, so the significant is is the high staff need um, for these models, and then um, we would be entering into agreements with the partnering organizations, and that would not exceed four thousand um, dollars for the OST middle school full-time program a fee revenue of 161460 with expenses at 160444 with a direct wage cost of 134572 um, So if the, if the OST programs are approved um, tonight, then an amendment to the 2021 fee schedule will be a separate agenda item. And the fees for both programs would change should um, the school district begin a blended learning model. So my recommendation for you this evening is to um, consider, sorry, to uh, consider and approve the temporary suspension of adult classes and allocate the use of the J Street Community Center for the out of school time OST recreation program. Consider and approve full time elementary and middle school out of school time programs, which may transition to a blended learning program should SoCal Union Elementary School District transition to that model for the 2021 school year. Authorize the city manager to enter into an agreement not to exceed $4,000 in total with partnering organizations to lease additional space for OST programs. Authorize the city manager to enter into an agreement with enterprise fleet management not to exceed $125,000 for a long-term vehicle rental should so called union transition to a blended learning model for the 2021 school year and adopt the proposed resolution amending the hourly seasonal pay schedule, creating three out of school time positions, the OST coordinator, the OST senior leader, and the OST leader. So that concludes my presentation and I am available for questions. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, council members, do we have any questions? Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, thank you, Nikki, for the presentation. Just one quick question. What will the grade cohorts look like for the elementary and middle school? 
Um, so what I would currently um, suggest is that we would break up elementary into um, two separate groups that we would enroll in cohorts that would go from kindergarten to second grade and then third to fifth grade. And um, so uh, I had originally thought that it would be like two classrooms of for uh, kindergarten through second and two classrooms of third through fifth. And then the remaining two rooms that we currently have um, secured would be an additional two middle school. I don't anticipate restricting middle school enrollment other than just the full six through eight, but I would anticipate it being the majority of the sixth grade. And Nikki, have you um, looked at whether or discussed, I didn't see it in the report, whether the priority would uh, for enrollment would go to directly to um, uh, folks who are considered essential workers? Yeah, so we would be providing a priority enrollment period for essential workers as well as the Soquel Union Elementary School District teachers. Okay, and then sorry, I said one question, but I, I, I have one more. Um, what would, how would scholarships be deciphered? Um, so we have um, the summer programs, we have the Capitola Foundation um, reviews our scholarship applications. So independently of us, they review scholarship applications and then allocate funds to those families that communicated to us and we award um, individuals that are enrolled. And so we have reached out um, to that same organization and made a request for them to uh, also take on the OST programs for the school year um, and are eagerly awaiting that answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Council Member Bertrand had his hand up next and then we'll go to uh, Council Member Story. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have two questions. Where's the Shore Life Church? I forgot. Yeah, Shore Life Church is actually just down the street from um, the the school district office. That's um, awesome. It's <laughs> it's a uh, Kennedy and Monterey. It's, I'm forgetting the streets off the top of my head. I know Randy is on. Um, is on as an attendee right now who is the pastor of Shore Lake Church. So he could probably give you some better uh, directions as to exactly where it is. I should also point out that um, school district staff are also currently on as attendees um, should any other questions would be directed to them. I thought that's what the church is. I, I passed by it so fast that I have a different name for it in my mind. And um, so being that's the church and you know, they're very community-minded. Um, they also provide housing uh, for some of um, They have a program on housing. I'm not sure how they choose the members that get there. But uh, they do a lot of things for homeless community, and I think it's a great partner. So I'm very happy that you, you reached out to them. Uh, my daughter went to their after-school program, which is no longer in existence. They did have a regular after-schools program. So that was a great boon to the community when my daughter was at Capitol Elementary. So I'm glad you reached out to them. My second question is, and I don't want a lot of detail, I just want to get an idea. Um, the programming, how is that devised and, and where is that going to come from? You know, you're going to have a, a broad section of students, either grammar or middle school. So how is that going to be dealt with? Um, the programming, the programming that is happening for recreational activities, if that's what you're asking about? Yeah, how, how's that put together? I mean, you're a recreation director, so, you know, this is what you live and breathe. But I was just wanting to get a better idea of how that's being put together, that's all. Yeah, um, I, I think that it's definitely still in the development phase, um, okay. but we would be looking at it in um, much of the same way that many of the county programs um, that 
started providing for county staff or city staff um, where they would have a schedule that would include the distance learning time that was spent for students um, and then implementing um, more traditional recreation activities. And much like the after school rec club, we drew on some STEAM activities. We tried to tap into um, sports and recreation activities. And then it would be figuring out what we would be able to do with the current limitations. So everything currently needs to be reviewed um, in order to ensure that appropriate social distancing um, and um, the materials that are involved in activities are able to be um, individually spaced and all the different protocols that are required uh, currently. So it, it'll take a little bit of analysis in order to identify, but I feel confident that we will still be able to, just like the camp program that we currently have, um, provide not only a space for youth to do their educational um, responsibilities and support them in lieu of working parents and then transition to um, enrichment activities and homework and a nice safe space for them to be in. Okay, I'd love to hear more about in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah. Council Member Story? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, Nikki, this sounds like um, uh, a really uh, filling uh, important need for child care um, with schools be, being parts of closed. My question goes to the loss in the um, adult class revenue of 250000 Assume that that will be offset by equivalent expenses to, uh, in essence, neutralize um, that lost revenue. Um, I'm not prepared to answer that question this evening. I, there, there will be, yes, there, there are associated expenses. Um, we would be, we're, we're not paying the contractors that we would typically be paying in order to um, provide those programs. But exactly what that is, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I'm not sure if Jim does or... I think, I think I can offer that more than anything with the decision to not have adult rec classes, which really doesn't look feasible moving forward through the first half of the year at least, there's going to be a fiscal impact because we were projecting some revenues from that. So there will be some revenue, sa uh, sorry, expenditure savings as well, but I think we need to be prepared that when we get into the budget update coming up at the end of um, in September, that that is going to be one of the hits we're going to see. Um, Hopefully there won't be just hits and there'll be some uh, positives as well, but that is what we'll be looking at. Okay, thank you. I can give a little more detail. The um, adult class budget had $250,000 of revenue and about $140,000 worth of expenses. So losing adult classes is, is gonna be something we're gonna have to adjust to as we go through the year and do budget amendments. All right, thank you. Um, I just have one question in regard to the loss of a polling place. Have we identified any sites that could potentially um, supplement the, the polling place that we're losing? I know that there's a lot of encouragement for, uh, for everyone to do vote by mail this year, um, but because of the, the circumstances surrounding the pandemic, I am concerned about the, um, the loss of the polling place. So I'm just wondering if we've looked into um, I don't know if the spirit store would be out of the Sears building by three days after Halloween, but have we looked into any other uh, potential sites to replace that loss of a polling place? So um, in preparation for this, this presentation and planning this program, I reached out to the county clerk's elections office and spoke to an individual there that was uh, identified on the letter that was sent to us. Um, and was originally trying to identify if we would be the, so the current plan that they would like is to have a polling place from October 31st through November 3rd. So that is Saturday through Tuesday. And um, I had asked if we would be able to do part of that. And their general feeling was is that it was kind of an all or none sort of thing. But because of the 
um, difference in the way that elections are going to be operated, um, she felt that as long as the city of Capitola had identified one single um, polling place, that it would be more than enough. Um, and that was a, a phone conversation that I had, and um, and no no follow up information from them. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, with that, we'll bring this to public comments. I will turn it over to our moderator to let us know if there's any public comment on this item. Senator Peterson, I do not, oh wait, I do see, I'm sorry, someone did raise their hand. Uh, Randy Redswig, I believe, is, sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak on behalf of the church. Uh, our agenda is to be a help to our community. And uh, we live here, we wanna be a part of it, uh, especially with the, the pandemic. And if we can help, uh, we will do whatever we can do to be assistance. Thank you. Thank you. I do not see any other hands and uh, I do not see any emails regarding this item. Okay, I see uh, Scott Turnbull has his hand up. It looks like he's over in the panelist section now. Um, Scott, are you uh, looking to provide public comment? Public comment, if that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, go ahead. Uh, we would just like to say from SoCal Union Elementary School District how appreciative we are of um, the support of the city council and the city and specifically Nikki Bryant who has really uh, reached out to us and um, one of the things we really appreciate is that she has listened and tried to understand our need. A uh, need for child care in our area uh, I think is, has uh, always been a challenge and never more so than it is right now as we have had to toggle back and forth between a hybrid learning model and a distance learning model. So we're just very appreciative in our district that uh, the city and uh, the city really walks the walk when it comes to supporting families. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, seeing no additional public comment, I will bring it back to council for a discussion and a vote. I see Councilmember Botchworth has his hand raised. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to second the comments that Scott Turnbull mentioned about how. Uh, uh, Mickey and the city stepped up on this project. Uh, you know, a lot of things we do are repeat programs that we do year after year. And this was truly a case where we had to reinvent the wheel and to do it in such a uh, short time frame. And, and the presentation that I saw seems like it dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's. Uh, Mickey, I just want to commend you on a great job and uh, I look forward to seeing this plan implemented. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bator. Vice Mayor Brooks? Yeah, I'd like to echo what everyone has been saying. Um, I, I first want to say thank you to Randy and Scott for opening their doors to this program. Um, when I was elected in 2018, one of my priorities was to start uh, securing and help create programs that would support our families. And during this, this pandemic, it really has um, highlighted that there are many, many families in our community that really would, are in need of support, especially right now. And Nikki, you championing and um, filling this kind of vision inside of my head really, really um, makes me happy and proud to be a council member um, and to be able to work with you. So thank you so much. Um, this as you know, I work for the County Office of Education. I sit on the Child Advisory Committee and the Children's Network, and every day I'm hearing what these needs are. And so we're going to be filling just a very small void, and I hope to see that these programs continue to grow if need be, um, should the, the uh, distance learning continue and or the second model. Um, so with that, I would like to make a motion to uh, pass the recommended actions uh, proposed by staff tonight. And I'll second that. I'll second that, and I have some comments too. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Councilmember Bertrand, go ahead. Now, I read early on how Nikki approached 
setting up programs, and one of the things that impressed me when she first started was she she reached out to and made a pretty good assessment of what's out in the community. Uh, what are the options that we could um, collaborate with? Um, what what are the needs? You know, I was very impressed on how she approached the start of her job here in Capitola. And I think this is a product of that. And working with the school district, working with the community life down the street on Monterey, I think it's just the beginning. And thank you very much for doing this. And as our vice mayor said, this fills a major need, but it's a need that we're starting to address, which we really haven't done as fully as we have in the past, as we should have been doing in the past. Of course, we do junior guards, but I think we're expanding quite a bit more in regards to our commitment to the community in regards to the youth and the community. So thank you very much for this. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Uh, seeing no further council comments, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Definitely, yes. Council Member Batorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We're going to move on to item 7D, consider an amendment, excuse me, consider an amended fee schedule for fiscal year 2021. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, just think, let me share my screen with you here. And so this next item is an amendment to the fee schedule that's in relation to the item that you just heard on the outside of school time program. Um, just by way of background, we review the fee schedule each year as part of our budget process and our uh, current fiscal year 2021 fee schedule was adopted by council on June 11th. Since okay. that time, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Are we supposed to be seeing your screen? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we don't see, there's nothing on the screen share. Apologies for the interruption. No, nope, I'm glad you did. Let me try this again. This happened last time. Is that better? Still don't see anything. It's possible Larry needs to uh, give you permission there. Share on both sides. It's not, yeah, don't share both sides. Huh? Don't do that. Okay, Larry's going to grab this for me. Sure, no problem. Not sure what's going on. That's pretty much the motto of this entire year, though, isn't it? Not sure what's going on. Jim, I can run it from here. Okay, thank you. There we go, we can see it now. Okay, so um, current fee schedule was adopted June 11th of this year, and since that time, as Nathan just mentioned, they've developed the out-of-school time program for both elementary and middle school students. So next slide, please. So by way of revenue, Nikki touched on this a little bit, I'll just drill down a little bit more to explain how we got to the fees that were um, proposing this evening. So revenues across the top for each program, uh, elementary 297, middle school 161,000, a little bit over for a total of 458. Expenditures, um, I think Nikki gave you the total in her presentations, but it breaks out into uh, personnel, contract services, training and memberships and supplies as you see on the screen. So what um, we tried to do, what Nikki and I tried to do was allocate direct expenses in, into the month in which they will occur. So for example, um, snacks are $2 a day. We know how many days, how many students in each month. So we allocate that directly to that month. General training, I think we have $2,000, 10 month program that's allocated $200 a month. And then that way we were able to develop a fee 
a daily fee that is the same within each program, regardless of the number of days in the month. Uh, next slide, please. So for the elementary school, um, you can see that the proposed resident fee is $34 a day, and the non-resident fee is $43 per day. And then the monthly total will vary from month to month based on the number of days the program will operate within those given months. So August and December are the same. They both operate 14 days, and then you can see each month and how many days for each one. And then we also have a late pickup fee that we're proposing of a dollar per minute, which is consistent with our after-school program that we normally run. Uh, next slide, please. For whoop, one too many. For the middle school, the resident fee we're proposing is $37 a day and non-resident fee $46 a day. Um, and that follows, I, I should have mentioned this on the last slide, the non-resident fee is typically 25% higher than, than the resident fee, and that's consistent throughout our whole fee schedule. And then again, um, the monthly fees for each program is dependent upon the number of days within each of those months. But what we wanted was something that was the same on a daily basis for each of the students rather than one month it's $20 a day and the next month it's $40 a day. Um, next slide, please. So that's actually all I have on the fees. Uh, Mickey already has covered the entire program. So our staff's recommendation is to conduct the public hearing tonight and adopt the proposed resolution um, adopting the amended fee schedule. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, questions from council members? Council member Story. Do you have a question, council member Story? I do. Sorry, it just took me a minute to uh, get to the right screen. Um, Jim, in the uh, list of expenditures, um, I noticed that there's no line item for uh, indirect or overhead expenses. Um, I just wanted to ask about that, and is that being absorbed through the general fund? Um, this, the way we do our recreation budget, and Nikki and I have talked about this a little bit, is we don't charge overhead to any of the programs. We budget revenues and expenditures exclusive to just that program. This, the OST programs will not generate any additional overhead. Um, the overhead that we have is, is there whether this program is, goes on or not. If that, if that makes sense to you. It does. Can I, I also just want to chime in a little bit on that. So the direction I gave Nikki as we were setting up this program was to make sure that the program itself was revenue neutral. The challenge with these, these programs for youth right now is they're incredibly expensive because of the restrictions around coronavirus. They just become very difficult to put on and so our goal was to keep it revenue neutral. That is, the pro putting on the program wasn't going to put us in a worse place than we were before, but at the same time, do our best to keep the cost down as low as possible. So, for example, historically with our Junior Guard program, we have used revenue from the Junior Guard program to fund some of the overhead for the department. We weren't able to do that this year because of the requirements about the increased staff ratios, the fewer children, and everything else. Same thing here. So. The bad news is that we're not being able to fund the back of house costs. The good news, though, is we're being able to provide this this uh, very needed service in the community. You consider that a worthy trade-off. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Bertrand. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jim, maybe uh, you can answer this question, or maybe Nikki. What's a comparable price that similar programs might charge or maybe there's nothing that we can compare it to. I'm just trying to get an idea of 34, you know, where does this fit in the normal scheme of things? I'm going to defer to Nikki on that one because I don't think there are any other programs exactly like this in existence right, right now. Right. Um, thank you. Yeah, I. that's correct. This is a completely new um, idea of providing program to school age youth. Um, honestly, the best comparison that I have is to preschool. And I mean, I could tell you, I personally pay like $70 a day. 
Um, so <laughs> the, uh, as far as what we're doing, it's a completely, completely new thing. Um, and the programs that are in existence across the county that started in April um, were were funded from lots of different sources. So there isn't really a, a, any kind of history in order to go off of. So the method that Jim and I set out was trying to identify a fair theme that um, uh, with Jamie's direction of how we needed to do it for the budget. Thank you. I just have a quick question about the uh, late pickup fee. Does that go into program revenue? Or does that go directly to the um, provider that was um, that was there late? It goes to program revenue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions? Seeing none, we'll open this uh, item for public comment, and I'll turn it over to Larry to moderate our public comment. Thank you, Mary Peterson. Um, I do not see any hand raised in the Zoom meeting, and I do not see any emails regarding this issue, or this item, excuse me. All right. With that, we'll bring it back to council for a discussion and a vote. Uh, see Council Member Bertrand. You're on mute still, Council Member Bertrand. I keep trying to, <laughs> um, I move that we adopt the proposed resolution amending the fee schedule for the fiscal year 2020 to 2021. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote, please? Absolutely. Council Member Bertrand. Yes. Council Member Botswerp. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we'll move on to the final item of the night. Uh, consider an approval of contract change order number eight for the Capitola Branch Library Project. I'll turn it over to staff for a report. Evening, Mayor and Council. I'm going to share my screen. I hope so. Mayor and Council, the item before you tonight is a change order number eight for the Capitola Branch Library Project. Um, per our change order policy, any change order over $50,000 needs council approval. Uh, we've had seven change orders for that. All have not needed council approval, but have been reported out at various times during the project. Um, a little background on the reason for this change order is in April of last year, conflicts between the building that's being built and the power lines along Wharf Road was identified. Um, we went through various design iterations, uh, liquid undergrounding, uh, costs were too prohibitive, and been working with PG&E for the last several months, and PG&E has designed a project to re relocate the wires away from the building as part of providing a new electrical service connection for the building. So they've kind of combined it into two. Um, city signed a contract with PG&E earlier this month to complete the removal of the wires and provide the service connection for $1,500. Um, we are currently waiting for PG&E to schedule construction. Um, as far as our contract with auto construction is the general contractor on the project. Uh, originally had an ending date of, uh, that they had to meet of February of this year. That was extended to May due to weather. Um, they cannot be compensated for delays caused by weather. So the current <clears throat> contract uh, schedule calls for completion of May 6, 2020, which was well, at least a couple months ago. Um, 
As we near that date, we've been working with Auto to identify their costs uh, that they're going to have to incur due to delays uh, that are not at a fault of theirs. So contract change order number eight extends the contract through June 20th, which again has already occurred, but Auto is continuing to work, but it compensates them for those six weeks between May 6th and June 20th. Once PG&E schedule is known, we'll be able to accurately predict when the project will be able to be completed, and we will uh, prepare another change order to extend it to that date. This time we're estimating that to be December of this year. So looking at contractor contract change order number eight, it's the first claim we received for delay costs and conflicts with power lines. The amount of the change order request is $120,688. Of that, $111,789 is for the extension of the contract. That's that six weeks we're extending it. And these are for costs that, P that auto is having to occur, just as insurance costs, overhead costs, site management costs that they aren't covered in pay items that are in the project, like completing the roof or completing putting the HVAC system in. These are costs that for them to manage the project to be on site and keep working. Um, and additional $8,900 of work is related to changes in the roof structure that would require additional work from them. In this case, it's uh, they had to modify the roof trusses to eliminate the overhang on the roof um, along Wharf Road because it would have been in conflict with the power line. Um, once the power lines are moved, then they will come back and add that overhang. Um, just to clarify, auto can claim costs for delays that are caused by the city or design errors and changes. So they're not eligible, like I said, if it rains, they're not eligible for delay costs. If it's delays caused by them, it'll cause them to go beyond the contract uh, dates, then that is not something they're eligible for. But these delays uh, clearly are something that we feel they are eligible for reimbursement for. So our recommendation tonight is to approve contract change order number eight, the amount of $120,688 for additional project costs related to the conflict with pg and power lines. That's the end of my report. And you know, we do have Dave Kanza in attendance tonight, who is our project manager and is available to help with any questions you may have. Thank you, Steve. Uh, do we have any questions from council members? Seeing no questions, we will open this up for public comment. Turn it over to Larry. Um, I don't see any attendees um, with their hands up, and I don't make sure I have the right one. I do not see any with anyone with emails on this item. Okay. Uh, with that, we will close public comment and bring it back to council. I see council member Bertrand has his hand up. Yeah, uh, Dave, stay <laughs> for this whole meeting. I'd kind of like to see if he had anything <laughs> to say. Um, I appreciate him being online and unfortunately it was the last item in agenda. So and if you have any illumination about how pg e has acted or not acted, that would be interesting <laughs> also. <laughs> um, I hate to keep you there for another hour to talk about pg e Oh, please don't. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you recall when we bid the project, auto bid a, uh, we, all the bidders bid their daily rate for compensable delay, which they're entitled to um, use for delay claims. And that was about $2,500 a day. Um, and through negotiations and their um, willingness to, you know, work with us on this project, you know, this change order um, represents about $2,000 a day. So they're, you know, they're working oh. with us. They're not taking advantage of the situation. And so I just want to mention that they've been really great to work with. Thanks for that. that that's, that's good to know. That really is. Uh, Councilmember Botworth. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I appreciate the, all the effort. Uh, motion to approve staff recommendation. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Botworth, a second by Councilmember Bertrand. Any comments? None. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botworth. Aye.
Councilmember Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Before we wrap up our meeting, uh, it was an oversight on my part to not request a report out on the closed session. So let's do that uh, briefly and then we will uh, adjourn our meeting. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Closed session was held on the four items on the agenda and no action was taken. Uh, direction was given to staff. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, we've come to the end of tonight's agenda. Thank you all so much for your participation and for the public comments we received tonight. Thank you for staff, as always, for all your hard work on this. Um, please take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Have a good night. Good night.